Hi, everyone. I'm Robbie Diamond, CEO and founder of SAFE. And welcome to this webinar hosted by the SAFE American Semiconductor Center. And a special welcome to our uh, European viewers. I guess we're standing between you and the weekends. So in uh, one short hour, you can all uh, enjoy enjoy uh, enjoy your weekend. Um, we're pleased to have us uh, with us today, Chris, Dr. Chris Miller, author of uh, Chip War, The Fight for the World's Most Critical Technology. Um, uh, Chris is a uh, professor at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, in which I um, am an alumni. So it's great to see uh, he came after me, but it's great to see such a talent um, at my alma mater. Um, Chip War, which uh, you can see here, is on the New York Times list of business bestsellers and has garnered a long list of stellar reviews, including from friends of SAFE. It's great to see so many people we work with on the back of uh, your book, singing your praises, um, Admiral James Javridis um, and uh, Dan Jurgen, the great energy expert. And it's also an amazing timing that uh, you came out with your book just uh, weeks before the uh, CHIPS Act passed and uh, right, after, and, uh, right before um, they put the ban on, on some, uh, some uh, Americans working in the chip industry in uh, China. So perfect timing, timing is everything in the world. Uh, just quickly about SAFE, SAFE started about 19 years ago, and our mission was to end oil dependence for economic and national security. And you can ask yourself why, if we cared so much about oil, are we now talking about chips? But I think fundamentally at the core of uh, SAFE as an organization has always been this question of dependence on others, many of them who do not share our values. Um, that has both constrained our foreign and military policy, as well as constrained um, our economic growth. So back 19 years ago, there was a global war on terror. There's two wars uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq. And we were very concerned that we weren't doing everything we could from using our own resources to conserving our own resources with fuel efficiency standards. And finally, diversifying away from oil to uh, transportation sector electric vehicles that had a diverse set of fuels. Of course, those electric vehicles also require lots of chips. So as we started thinking about electric vehicles, both our dependence on batteries um, and then uh, potentially on chips and other technologies, what we like to say is we don't want to go from the Saudi frying pan into the Beijing battery fire. So we started a group called Commanding Heights that has uh, an American semiconductor center, a center for critical mineral strategy, and a center for materials uh, strategy. So with that, um, which is what brings us uh, here today. Now, there's been great quotes about this book uh, and about chips. Uh, Larry Summers once said, semiconductors may be the 21st century what oil was to the 20th century. If so, the history of semiconductors will be the history of the 21st century. If you care about technology, America's future prosperity or its continuing security, there's a book you have to read. Now, uh, once again, that, that comparison, unfortunately, we're both dependent on oil and we definitely do not want to become dependent on chips. You know, Pat uh, Gelsinger of, uh, of Intel also said, God decided where the oil reserves are, we can decide where the fabs are. And that is really the point of our discussion today um, with uh, Dr. Miller, um, where the fabs are, where the future fabs will be, what this means for the world, and some of the things that we'll be, uh, that I said we'll be talking about today. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Peter uh, Flory, who's a senior fellow um, at the uh, Semiconductor Center and a director of the center, um, as well as Joris Tier, who's joining us from the Hague Center for Strategic Studies, and they'll have this conversation uh, with Dr. Miller. I can't wait to hear about it. So thank you all so much for uh, joining us. And please keep in contact. Please email us. We'd love to work with uh, many of the people who are watching today. Great. Robbie, thank you very much for that, uh, for that introduction. Uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon to our European viewers. Uh, we will try to get you on your way for your weekend before too, too long, but not before we've had a good, uh, a good discussion here. Um, uh, Dr. Miller, uh, in particular, welcome to you. Uh, I know you've been a busy man since you came out. Well, you were a busy man before you came out with this book. Um, but now you are, uh, as Robbie mentioned, it is a function of timing, very much the man of the hour with this book about the, the tiny chip that, is, that has become the cornerstone of the, uh, of the modern economy and global power. 
Uh, Joris will join us a little later with some questions for Dr. Uh, Miller. Uh, Joris comes from uh, co-authoring a report that in particular highlights the connection between a couple of our threads here at SAFE. Uh, one of them is semiconductors, but the other one is, uh, is critical, uh, critical minerals. A quick word on housekeeping. There will be an opportunity for audience Q&A. Uh, please do submit them uh, uh, as early as you can via the chat function. That just makes it easier for us to manage them on this end. And in terms of timing, we want to be able to, uh, to accommodate uh, your questions. So we have arranged to go a little bit past 11 here uh, if the questions are still, uh, are still coming in. Uh, I, I won't dwell on, on uh, uh, all of Chris's credentials here, but uh, uh, I think we can go uh, straight to the heart of the matter, which is in his in his spare time uh, when he wasn't at the Fletcher School or AEI or the Foreign Policy Research Institute, uh, he was writing this book, which many of us have read, and which uh, no less a luminary than Daniel Jurgen has called, uh, uh, as Robbie said, essential for understanding our modern world. Um, Chris, with your professional affiliations and everything else you've got going on. Uh, what was it about the semiconductor uh, world and situation that drove a busy and accomplished, uh, uh, what you might call traditional historian like you, to drill down on this uh, highly, uh, highly technical issue? And in, in light of what, uh, what, uh, what focused your attention on that, what do you see as the two or three most important findings in the book? Well, I actually started uh, this book not intending to write a history of the computer chip, but intending to write a history of missile guidance systems during the Cold War competition. And the initial question I wanted to answer was, why was it that during the early Cold War, both the United States and the Soviet Union could produce the key military, military technologies of that era, nuclear weapons and long range missile delivery systems. Whereas in the later Cold War, the US jumped ahead in military power thanks to its ability to deploy computing across military systems and the Soviet Union objectively failed to do so. And I wanted to understand, well, why was this? Why could the Soviet Union produce lots of nuclear weapons? But by the 1980s, the joke in Soviet circles was that uh, it was of a bureaucrat who came to the general secretary of the Communist Party and said, comrade, comrade, we've built the world's largest microchip. Uh, and that was, that was uh, uh, something of a puzzle to me because there were, of course, brilliant physicists in the Soviet Union, lots of capital investment the government put towards uh, this industry, but uh, their, uh, their industry just simply couldn't keep up and was uh, hopelessly reliant, uh, not only on uh, chips that were smuggled in from abroad, but also chip making equipment that uh, this KGB repeatedly tried to um, pilfer in from, uh, from the US and from Europe. And I was doing this initial research uh, just in uh, 2015, 2016, 2017, as the US was beginning to ramp up some of its technological limitations on Chinese firms, which uh, I came to realize, and I think many of us came to realize, had everything to do with semiconductors, because it was semiconductors that China was heavily reliant on importing. And one of the um, data points that I learned and that convinced me to write this book about chips uh, more generally was that over the past decade, uh, for many years, China has spent uh, just as much money importing semiconductors as it has importing oil, which gives you a sense of China's reliance on this technology. But of course, if you dig into the trade data, you find China is not primarily importing chips from the US, it's importing chips from Taiwan and from South Korea. So the more I learned about the industry, the more I realized that it actually stands at the center of today's uh, economy, of today's tech sector, and also of the present and future balance of uh, military power. Because like during the early Cold War, today more than ever before, military systems rely on computing power and therefore rely on semiconductors. So a couple things, uh, a couple lessons that uh, I've taken away from this work. First off is that the world is completely and utterly reliant on the production of advanced processor chips in Taiwan, where the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company produces 90% of the world's most advanced processor chips, the type of chip that goes in smartphones or in PCs or in data centers. The Taiwanese have a unparalleled and practically irreplaceable role in their production. And so if something were to go wrong 
in the Taiwan Straits, uh, it would be immensely difficult uh, to replace Taiwanese capacity. It'd be just simply impossible to do uh, in a matter of months. It would take years uh, to do, and the economic impact would be dramatic. Second, and related to the importance of Taiwan, is China's ambitions in this sphere, because although China today spends uh, many billions of dollars importing chips, it's also spending comparable sums of money trying to subsidize its own domestic chip making industry with the goal of weaning itself off reliance on imported chips and chip making technologies, and thereby reducing its vulnerability to the types of export controls that we've seen the US rely on over the past couple of years. And although China still remains quite far behind in many of the key technologies. It has made some strides, some important strides in recent years. And I don't think anyone can uh, fully discount its ambitions, especially given the successes China has had in many other spheres uh, of advanced manufacturing. And third, this is important, both the reliance on Taiwan and China's ambitions in its own chip industry, precisely because just as in the past, today, there's a deep relationship between advances in microelectronics and military power. And although it's the case that most military systems generally rely on less advanced chips than you can find, for example, if you go to an Apple store and buy a new iPhone, it's also the case uh, that it's been microelectronics that have driven advances in US military power over the past several decades and are very likely to drive them in the future. If you ask yourself, what differentiates a fighter jet from 50 years ago from a fighter jet today. It's not that they're faster, maybe a little bit faster. It's not that they carry uh, greater payloads, maybe they do to a certain extent, but the primary differentiating factor is they've got more computing, better sensors, more robust communications, plus an entire ecosystem of intelligence and surveillance uh, that is able to transmit data to them for targeting, for, um, uh, for communications purposes. So this entire communications and computing ecosystem has transformed the nature of military power, uh, and it will continue to do so in the future. And so as defense planners in Washington, but also in Beijing, think about next generation military systems. They're thinking about systems that are more autonomous, that have more communications capacity, more sensing uh, capabilities, and all that means more semiconductors. And so I think it's no uh, oversimplification to say that whichever military is able to access the most advanced microelectronics has a meaningful leg up in military competition. And therefore, control over the world's most advanced chips isn't simply a question of technology or economy. It's fundamentally a question of the future of the military balance. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, what One can't help reflect in hearing that, that uh, while the uh, competition with the Soviet Union turned out pretty well from our perspective, uh, the competition with China and, and frankly with the world at large for uh, chip leadership has been more complicated and having, having uh, invented the chip, uh, we're now in a situation where, in the words of the White House, we need to uh, make transformative investments to restore and advance our nation's leadership uh, in the research, development and manufacturing of semiconductors. That's from the White House statement on the president's signing of the CHIPS Act. Uh, which is uh, in many ways the, big, the biggest uh, news in the topic, at least until your book and the export controls. So what in your view has to happen to ensure that the CHIPS Act uh, has a reasonable chance of meeting these uh, ambitious goals? And uh, in your book, you, you make it clear, and I think most people understand this, but nobody's really answered it. Um, no nation can become completely self-sufficient in chips, and, and the world doesn't want or need every nation to be self-sufficient in chips. Uh, what level of capacity uh, and self-reliance do you think should be the goal of the U.S. government and industry as they uh, move ahead with implementing the CHIPS Act? Well, I think there's a key distinction to be made between reliance on adversaries and reliance on allies. Uh, and I do worry that when some political leaders talk about the chip industry, they talk about onshoring as the primary goal. Uh, and I think that's the wrong way to look at the chip industry, because I don't worry that much about the importation of advanced chemicals from Japan, for example, or machine tools from the Netherlands. But I worry a lot about our reliance on importing chips from geopolitical hotspots like Taiwan, and also a fair amount about our reliance on less sophisticated chips uh, imported from China. So I think we've got to be very, very deliberate 
in identifying which types of supply chain vulnerabilities we're actually worried about and which types of interconnections are fine because they're with allies that we've got deep uh, and comfortable uh, relationships with. And so the CHIPS Act has got to be seen in that context. If we look at it as trying to onshore all of our production capabilities, trying to become self-sufficient in chips, we are guaranteed to fail. That's just not a plausible outcome. If we look at it as a way to increase America's weight in the chip supply chain and reduce vulnerabilities and reliance uh, on production on both sides of the Taiwan Straits, I think there's a reasonable chance of succeeding. The second thing that is uh, unique to the chip industry relative to most other parts of the economy is the rate of innovation. Moore's law, since it's, uh, it was first coined in the 1960s, has dictated that the chip industry will uh, double in the computing power that an individual chip can produce roughly every two years. And that means that compared to all of the sectors of the economy, the chip industry races forward at a rate that's simply unparalleled. For policymakers, the challenge is that if you try to invest in today's technologies, you risk being out of date by the time uh, those facilities are built. And so we've got to make our policy thinking very hard about not where are we today, but where do we want to be in five or 10 years time? And how do we impact that trajectory over time? Because Moore's Law is going to continue at least for uh, another decade. And so if we build a lot of capacity in today's chip making um, nodes, well, that's going to be out of date uh, in 10 years time when we'll have had five rounds of doubling between now and a decade in the future. And so that's difficult for policymakers to think of because the industry does change so rapidly. But we've got to take advantage of Moore's law and push it forward uh, rather than focusing on capacity in uh, today's technological capabilities. Um, thank you, Chris. The, certainly the focus on, on secure, uh, secure supply lines and, uh, from friends and allies is a critical distinction, and, it's, and this is something that's been woven through our work uh, at SAFE since, uh, since the beginning. I certainly don't lie awake at night uh, worrying about the, the Dutch threat, for example. Um, uh, Joris, tell me if I'm, uh, if I'm wrong there. Um, Obviously, the, the Biden administration has acted strongly recently uh, with respect to export controls that are really designed to affect and limit Beijing's supercomputer and artificial intelligence capabilities, i.e. core uh, military technologies. And this is coming from an administration that generally uh, has not sought to uh, raise the level of confirmation uh, of confrontation with Beijing and, and, and in the words of the National Security Advisor, to, uh, represent a deliberate shift from the traditional sliding scale policy of maintaining a relative advantage of a couple of generations to seeking as much of a lead as possible. Now, in, in your view, um, uh, what were the key factors driving the US decision uh, and why now? And, and uh, secondly, uh, some people have argued that maybe while these export controls will blunt China's efforts in the short run, the approach could actually lead to Beijing achieving greater self-sufficiency sooner in the long run. Um, uh, is this a valid concern from your perspective? Well, to start with the question of why now, I view the most recent round of export controls not as something uh, really new, but rather as the culmination of a development we've seen over the past seven or so years of intensifying controls on the transfer technology to China. And I think if you look at around 2015 to the present, you see greater focus and realization in Washington that chips are strategically important. And you've seen a lot of new uh, understanding and new tools develop to impact the semiconductor supply chain. The Commerce Department, for example, has honed new regulations, giving it more extraterritorial uh, regulatory power when it comes to export controls. And so what we've seen in the last month or so is really the culmination of this broader trend. And it's driven above all, I think, by the deterioration of the military balance in Asia. Compared to 10 years ago, the U.S. is substantially less capable of repelling a Chinese attack on Taiwan, for example, than it would have been in the mid-1990s, uh, because China's built up its military and we've failed to match uh, China's uh, advances. And so the U.S. is looking at the, the balance in Asia, realizing that uh, its position has deteriorated uh, and is betting on computing power. It's advantages of computing power to uh, help um, help slow that uh, slow that shift. And so that is explaining, I think, why the U.S. is acting now or has been acting on this issue for uh, much of the past decade. 
In terms of what does it mean? Please go ahead. No, please. Well, in terms of the, the Chinese response, I think there's no doubt that China is going to try to domesticate uh, more of this technology, but that's not new. China has been trying to domesticate this technology for some time. Since 2014, in particular, the Chinese government has been focused on trying to reduce its reliance on foreign technology. And so I actually think it's implausible to argue that now the Chinese will really start trying hard to domesticate technology when in fact the government in Beijing has been spending billions of dollars a year precisely with this goal in mind for most of the past decade. Well, that actually is a great uh, segue into the question I was gonna ask next, which is uh, a question about the politics and culture of, of innovation and, and what it takes to really, uh, to really get to the leading edge. Uh, in the book, you describe the evolution of the uh, uh, of Beijing's approach to microelectronics generally from a, a, a schizophrenic mix of, of, of some of the worst, wackiest ideas from the Cultural Revolution and the, the Great Leap Forward, including uh, uh, exhorting the Chinese peasants to basically everybody should be making semiconductors, uh, while all of the uh, actual engineers and physicists were, were slopping out uh, 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 hog farms in the uh, in the country. Um, uh, today, instead, you have Xi Jinping's massive uh, a massive assault, really, on the commanding heights of the uh, of the technology. And you also mentioned up front the doomed efforts of another totalitarian adversary in the USSR to uh, copy its way to semiconductor competitiveness. Now, obviously, nobody would bet against the talents and the energy of the uh, of the Chinese people, Chinese scientists, Chinese workforce. Um, but uh, in your view, can the the uh, can the ideological and and control obsessed top down approach of the current Chinese leadership uh, does that really have a chance of, of fostering the kind of innovation uh, required to overtake the U.S. Uh, and its allies, and that's e even with the benefit of hundreds of billions of dollars of investment uh, and reams of, uh, of stolen technology. I mean, uh, do you think that can uh, that could work? Well, I think it, it really will be a challenge for, for China. I, we can't count them out in certain spheres, but when you look across the board, I, I do think their innovation ecosystem has taken a real hit over the past couple of years, both because it's been cut off from international connections, but also because the Chinese government has in some ways encouraged uh, these trends. And if you look at the subsidies in particular, the incentives they provide for Chinese entrepreneurs or Chinese ship firms are exactly backwards. If you wanna make money in the Chinese ship industry today, rather than trying to sell to global markets where you might be cut off if you succeed too well, uh, you're better off trying to win subsidies from your local provincial governor. And that can be a pretty lucrative business model in the short run. And indeed, we've seen uh, a, a fair number of Chinese ship firms uh, make a fair amount of money precisely by uh, appealing to uh, the generosity of government bureaucrats. But that's a bad business model in the long run um, because those subsidies won't last forever. And even if they do, they are not associated with technological advances. So I actually think China is, uh, the way that it's structured uh, its domestic market, the way that it's suffering from severed connections with international uh, partners, the subsidies actually risk creating a cutoff ecosystem in China uh, where the best entrepreneurs focus not on producing the best technology, uh, but on spending most of their energy trying to shake out more subsidies from Communist Party officials. Uh, and so I think if you had to assess China's policy to actually produce effective domestic technology, you'd pretty, you'd pretty low marks uh, thus far. And I think every step that she takes to try to increase the Chinese government's role in the chip industry is actually intensifying these problems rather than resolving them. Um, let me focus uh, a little bit on a, on a part of the uh, discussion that has gotten a lot of attention recently, which is the role of semiconductors in the automotive sector. Um, and I, 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 I would argue that the CHIPS Act might not have ever been passed uh, uh, if it hadn't been for the shortage of, uh, of not cutting edge chips uh, for the auto industry that made it very hard to afford a car uh, and caused a number of factories to uh, severely uh, shut down their, uh, their production for a long period of the COVID epidemic. Um, 
uh, electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles are not just an important part of, uh, uh, first of all, what we do here at SAFE in the area of transportation and environmental futures uh, and our mission generally, uh, but they're also an important driver of uh, future semiconductor requirements. And actually, we're lucky we have a couple of uh, leading companies from that uh, who focus on, on the automotive industry are actually part of our viewership today. But uh, two questions. One, are there any particular uh, challenges and opportunities that you see in this area as, as cars basically go from, from running on, on legacy chips to uh, becoming essentially uh, uh, smartphones with, uh, with wheels? And secondly, uh, in the area of, uh, of legacy chips, the, uh, there's been some concern that in the wake of the export controls, which target the cutting edge, uh, that China make, might see this as an opportunity to deliberately build in overcapacity in legacy chips. Obviously, legacy chips are, are not what they used to be. That's a constantly changing concept. Um, but given what China has done with wind and solar energy, uh, is there a risk that China might uh, basically decide to double down in that area uh, and create something like its dominant position in, uh, in rare earth minerals uh, and solar and uh, wind en energy uh, equipment and basically start dumping them on the global market? Well, I think you're right to flag the auto industry as a, a key consumer of chips and an increasingly important consumer going forward uh, for precisely the reasons you discussed, both the fact that we're putting more and more advanced technology in cars and the electrification of the auto fleet over time will also demand uh, more special power semiconductors to manage uh, the power supply in electric vehicles. So there's going to be more semiconductors in cars going forward than there's ever been in the past. And some of these will be uh, among the most advanced chips, especially the types of chips you need for autonomous driving features uh, requires very advanced technology, but there's a lot of low-tech chips, as you mentioned, uh, Peter, in, in autos. I think you're absolutely right to say there's a huge risk that China's subsidization and building of capacity in low-end legacy logic uh, will create a glut of overcapacity on world markets. And the fact that almost every major government, the US, Europe, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, China, um, are all putting money into building capacity and a substantial chunk of this capacity is gonna come in legacy nodes, uh, intensifies uh, this risk. And now China's putting more money in low-end logic than uh, anyone else, perhaps than the rest of uh, the world's subsidies combined. And dumping is a real problem. I wouldn't be surprised at all to see in a couple of years time, the question of trade remedies and uh, dumping tariffs be at the front of the political debate in uh, advanced economies precisely uh, for this reason. Right now on the export control front, the US has focused almost exclusively on pretty high-end chips and left uh, the sales of low-end chips and shipping equipment wide open. Um, it's possible that could also change, although I would guess that uh, if dumping becomes a problem, as I think it might, uh, policymakers would turn first to trade remedies like uh, like uh, trade suits and maybe tariffs before they would turn to export controls. But certainly I would not be surprised at all if in 2025, this is a matter of uh, top level political debate in places like the US, Europe and Japan. Thank you. Um... Congress has been one of the main players in, in the CHIPS Act. I mean, first of all, obviously, it had to, it had to enact it, uh, but also just in terms of the, uh, the, the energy and, and, and intellectual focus that, uh, uh, that got this bit of legislation done. Now, the CHIPS Act, first of all, it's only recently been passed, so obviously it needs some time to do what it's going to, going to do. Um, I think it's probably a safe bet with Republicans in control of the House now. We're not going to see any other big uh, uh, subsidy bills coming down the pike anytime soon. But uh, in addition to uh, implementing the CHIPS Act and doing a good job of, of implementing it, are there any other, uh, any other policy steps you think might be, uh, might be useful? For example, additional uh, tax incentives on the R&D side, maybe extending the current uh, tax incentive for manufacturing plants, uh, which is currently supposed to expire in a couple of years, making that permanent. Uh, are there other actions you think that Congress or the administration uh, should, still, uh, should still be considering? Well, I think you're right, Peter, to flag the time horizon question with the current CHIPS tax incentives, which I, I believe currently expire in 2027, if I recall correctly. 
you know, five years is a long time for Congress, uh, but it's not a long time for the chip industry. And so thinking about ways to extend those tax credits such that people can plan for investment cycles longer than uh, five years in the future, I think would be a very smart move. And we've seen other governments already uh, roll out new tax credits uh, in in competition um, with the moves that the US has taken. Uh, and we know historically that uh, having competitive tax policy is absolutely critical uh, in where companies decide to build their chip making facilities. There's just no doubt about that. Um, countries' tax policies is probably the number one um, uh, determinant of where fabs get built behind workforce questions. Um, so, so Congress, I think, should think hard about whether there's space to, to make additional moves on that front. And although in the CHIPS Act, a lot of the, the headlines the media have focused on the $39 billion of direct incentives, the, the amount of funds that will be spent on the tax incentive side is only slightly uh, less than that uh, and, and probably no less important in uh, helping to shape uh, companies' investment plans. The other big uh, question hanging over um, CHIPS policy in the U.S. is how the R&D side of the CHIPS Act funding will actually be set up. Right now, uh, there's very little certainty as to what direction the Commerce Department will take on the R&D side. And I think there's a huge skew of potential outcomes between limited success and tremendous success that we could see uh, from that uh, R&D funding. And so I'm uh, following very closely, I think, the, uh, the, 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 the proposals that are being discussed right now as to how to structure the R&D funds. Uh, and I think we need to keep a close eye on that to make sure that the bar is set quite high for success. We've got clear metrics for what uh, we want to achieve with those R&D funds, because I think it's quite easy for the government to set up a semiconductor research consortium, uh, have scientists in a building, declare success, uh, but actually not have accomplished all that much. And so we've got to make sure we've got structures in place that the around $12 billion that will be spent on R&D and workforce issues over the next uh, five years actually result in uh, real technological advancements that can be commercialized on the road. Before I hand off to Yoris Tier, um, uh, and in re relating to what you just said, uh, what in your view are some of the lessons from Semitech, which was the last uh, big US government uh, uh, attack on this problem? There's some people who say it was a success in a number of areas. Uh, in your book, you detail some of the ways in which it was less of a success, at least in the, uh, 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 in the DUV, EUV. Uh, area, but is there anything that uh, the people at the Commerce Department who are, uh, I have to say, they've, they've moved pretty smartly in rolling out uh, a strategy and getting uh, getting started on the implementation, but are there any things they should be keeping in mind from the Semitech experience? Well, I do think that the the experience from Semitech was mixed in terms of its outcomes. Uh, there were some successes, but also a number of programs, including some of the programs that they spent uh, the largest amount of resources on, uh, were failures. I think a couple of things to me stand out. First off, uh, if you're going to have multiple companies engage in a research consortium, you've got to make sure you're getting the best employees from those companies participating rather than the second best. And there's a strong incentive for companies to keep their best uh, ideas, their best employees, their best talent in-house so it doesn't um, it produces uh, new products of their companies rather than being spread around the industry. And so managing that dynamic is a real challenge for research consortia that bring together um, uh, people from different companies and and different groups. The second challenge, I think, is that Semitech uh, failed in, in the cases where it tried to focus on developing specific products. And in the lithography case in particular, Semitech actually supported a very capable lithography tool, which by all accounts was technologically um, very advanced, but it didn't find a market uh, because Semitech wasn't primarily a sales organization. It didn't, it didn't think like a business because that's not what it was supposed to do. And so the tool that it helped develop although it was technologically advanced, never found sufficient uh, market demand and so therefore didn't stay in production. And so uh, making sure that the uh, new R&D efforts are able to differentiate what firms are doing in terms of bringing products to market and what the government can do in terms of helping pre-competitive research is I think another key distinction uh, to make. And there's a real need on the one hand for more funding of pathways to move ideas from lab to fab, uh, as, as they like to say, but there's also risks involved. If you get too close to the commercialization process, you 
start dipping your toes into territory that is much better suited for companies than for government. Yeah. Well, I think one of the bigger themes of the book that comes across very well is um, when people talk about uh, industrial policy and the previous actions of the U.S. government, uh, the U.S. government wasn't in there directing, telling Texas Instruments and, and later Intel and others what to do. It basically started off by buying, as you say, a bunch of, uh, it had a requirement for uh, 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 computing capability that was small enough to go on a, on a missile or a space launch vehicle uh, and created the pull by which the industry was created. Okay, with that, let me hand off to, to Yoris Tier from the Hague uh, Center for Strategic Centers. Uh, Yoris is a co-author of uh, Reaching Breaking, Breaking Point, uh, the Semiconductor and Critical Raw Material Ecosystem uh, at a Time of Great Power uh, Rivalry. This is a uh, report on uh, both the upstream part of the semiconductor supply chain, i.e. the critical minerals, uh, that has gotten less attention than the, uh, than the downstream and particularly the, uh, uh, the manufacturing equipment, um, and also the risk of supply chain disruptions, either at the front end or at the back end. Um, but with that, let me, uh, let me hand the floor to Yoris and uh, for a few questions from him. Thank you so much, Peter. And Chris, I've read your book. It's a very interesting read and uh, I'm happy to talk to you here today. Um, I, um, everyone in Europe at the moment is sort of in a pickle now because we had a 40% gas dependency on Russia and suddenly it turned out that there were things that Vladimir Putin cares so much about that that gas tap can be turned off. Um, in terms of foresight, we are doing a lot of research looking into the future and the question that comes up is what is sort of the next crisis because of dependencies. Uh, and we were specifically asked to look at the semiconductor critical raw material supply chain dominated on the semiconductor end by the world's technologically advanced democracies. But what goes into a semiconductor? Well, you end up with gallium, germanium, rare earth elements, uh, cobalt, and it's either all mined and refined in China or for the vast majority, or just refined in China like cobalt. So we looked into the future. We asked experts uh, from the Netherlands in government, industry, et cetera, uh, and in academia as well. What are the odds, for instance, that Beijing in the next 10 years will put on a similar embargo as tensions rise because of, for instance, the export controls of the United States on these resources and what will happen to the supply chain? So um, we ended up with about a 60% chance of there being an export embargo of these products towards Europe. So not even just in the United States, but Europe. So what do you think of that number? And what do you think personally the impact would be if these sort of critical resources would be cut off? Well, well thank you, Russ. It's a, a, a great question and one that I don't think policymakers have thought nearly enough about. So I, I was glad to see your report on the topic and hopefully it will attract uh, some attention to the issue because it certainly would be a huge deal uh, if in fact China started restricting these supplies. And of course, as your report mentions, it's possible over time to uh, find alternative sources of supply and processing, uh, but that time is very valuable uh, and stockpiles are not high enough to meet demand uh, in the interim. You know, we, we do have some past case studies of um, more limited uh, restrictions. China about a decade ago uh, for a period of time restricted exports to Japan. Um, and I think there's debate as to the level of efficacy of that restriction. Um, on the one hand, it certainly imposed costs. On the other hand, it's not exactly clear that it achieved China's political goals uh, in imposing the restrictions. Um, we've also seen, uh, as your report mentions as well, this year Russia uh, imposed export controls on uh, certain types of gases used in uh, semiconductor production, as well as destroying the production of gas making facilities in, in Mariupol and elsewhere in Ukraine. I think the, the thing that works in our favor in these spheres is that there are ways to economize on mineral and gas uses if we need to. Uh, and with NEON, for example, we've seen uh, Russian disruptions have been less impactful than was feared uh, because industry was able to draw down its stockpiles, was able to recycle, was able to take steps that were expensive but manageable. Um, in other types of minerals, I think our alliance is greater and our ability to uh, take these types of steps to uh, these types of evasive measures uh, in a time of crisis is more limited. Uh, and those are the spheres where I think you'd expect China to act if indeed it wanted to act. 
However, I think the other factor that works in our benefit is that if China were to impose these types of restrictions on rare earths, for example, uh, this is a tool China could only use once before it would be, I think, guaranteed that the US and Australia and other countries would ramp up their production and processing. Uh, and in the interim, certainly the US and Europe would be hurt. The whole world would be hurt, including China, um, because there's no, I don't think, really plausible story by which dramatic restrictions wouldn't have major impacts on China um, too. Now, that doesn't mean China couldn't do it, because as we've seen with this year uh, and Russia, it's certainly possible. Thus far, however, uh, when it comes to the semiconductor space, China has chosen not to retaliate in economically costly ways. And so um, my my guess is that in response to the current round of export controls, China is not going to take that dramatic of a step. Uh, but that doesn't mean we should leave that option open uh, in the long run. <laughs> We'd be in a much better position if we had higher stockpiles, but also less reliance in the first place on China and Russia for some of these critical minerals. Uh, no, yeah, I completely agree. It's such a dramatic weapon that it would also hurt Chinese industry, etc. Uh, but we can't rule it out for now. If you look at the current export controls by the United States, what are these sort of more maybe then nimble ways in which China could actually strike that? Well, I think the, the answer is that there aren't that many great ways for China to strike back asymmetrically that hurt the U.S. more than they hurt China. There are a number of U.S. companies that perhaps China could take measures against, but the ones that would really make a difference, for example, obstructing Apple's supply chain, which really would have a big impact on the U.S., would also have a big impact on China. And I think that lack of asymmetric responses is why China hasn't really retaliated in the past to U.S. export controls and why we're now six weeks past uh, the imposition of U.S. controls and China's done nothing thus far. Now, maybe Chinese leaders are waiting for the right time uh, to strike, but also maybe they're not going to do anything Again, because they're focused on retaining what interconnections they have with, uh, with Western markets. And I think if you put yourself in the Chinese position, on the one hand, uh, the entire thrust of Xi Jinping's politics have been to throw up walls between China and the rest of the world. On the other hand, whenever Chinese leaders talk to industry, what they're told is we desperately need all the interconnections we can still salvage with the U.S., with Japan, with Taiwan, with Europe, because that's our, uh, that's our pathway for learning about advanced technologies. And so there certainly is a group among Chinese policymakers who are saying we must retain wherever possible interconnections uh, because that's our only hope for catching up. And I think those people who are saying that are correct. Uh, that is China's best hope for catching up. Uh, the challenge they face is that they're increasingly outweighed in Chinese policy debates by the um, by the the school of thought, which I think is um, centered around Xi, that throwing up walls between China and the rest of the world uh, is in China's interests, um, and 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 that's what's outweighing uh, the other school in, in terms of China's domestic political debates. And I read an article in the Dutch Financial Times today with a big screaming headline saying that U.S. pressure attempts on the Dutch to take measures on ASML and exports to uh, China are becoming increasingly, and the word that was used was undipl undiplomatic. So what they in practice meant, larger and larger delegations to, well, talk to our senior officials here. And I was wondering... Um, whether what is your opinion on the, the sort of new goal of the U.S. not staying one or two generations ahead anymore, but really maintaining a largest lead as possible? Can that be effectively achieved if allies in the end don't buy in? Well, I think when we look at the, the definition of the, the U.S. strategy as having changed over the past two months with Jake Sullivan's speech from September, I think the reality is that the, the U.S. goal of staying two generations ahead was a goal that was uh, first set forth in the 1990s and then persisted to the 2000s and 2010s when the key competitors were in Japan, Taiwan, and South Korea in terms of chip technology and when there were no competitors to U.S. military power. So that was a, a semiconductor policy that might have made sense in a different era when it was primarily about commercial technology and that U.S. military power was unmatched. But we're in a different world today. And I think the Biden administration's shift on this issue, which is, I think, a very bipartisan shift, um, is a response to the fact that we are in a different world, both in terms of tech competition and in terms of the military balance. So do allies play a role? I think absolutely. Um, I think there's a couple of dynamics at play. First is that although 
the controls that the administration announced are unilateral. I think we do see in certain allies um, a, an understanding of the controls coupled with a desire to hide behind the U.S. so that they don't get retaliated against from Beijing. And if you look, for example, at Korea, uh, which a decade ago faced a really tough economic pressure campaign from China when it imposed, when it uh, set up a, a missile defense system, there's a real institutional memory there of Chinese coercive economic power. And so it's understandable that smaller countries will want to be able to tell Beijing it wasn't our choice, the U.S. made us do it. So I think that dynamic is very real, and we need to keep that in mind when looking at allied responses. Um, but I do think that in some allies, and I think especially in Europe, where, where China is seen as a less immediate threat uh, in general than in the U.S., there's an insufficient appreciation of the extent to which this is not really about trade. It's not really about commercial tech. This is fundamentally about the strategic balance between the U.S. and China. Um, and that's something that I think some of the Trump administration's mixing of the trade rhetoric and the strategic competition rhetoric muddled the message of. Uh, and so there are still people who look at something like export controls as a question of the trade deficit. This is a different issue. This is all about the military balance. Uh, and I think when you put it in these terms, companies and allied countries begin to understand what's at stake. But there's still a messaging process that's underway uh, to help chip firms and help companies across the supply chain realize that this is no longer in the sphere of trade issues or intellectual property concerns. This is about a fundamental strategic competition. Mm -hmm. And then my final question. So from the same for sort of threat expert survey, we also, I mean, the expert indicated that um, they expect there is a larger than 50% chance that we'll see a maritime blockade or an invasion of Taiwan of some sort or somewhere in between of these two things in the next 10 years. So you already alluded to that that will be disastrous to the world economy. The United States apparently sort of in private told European nations that they expect the annual damage to be around 2.5 trillion. But can you maybe uh, elaborate a bit on a couple of the pathways, the chain reactions in the world economy that you see once this huge supply of chips is taken offline, let's say for, I mean, uh, several years? Well, if you look at today, Taiwan produces most of the world's smartphone processors. So it'd be basically, it'd be very, very difficult to produce a smartphone anywhere in the world without uh, without access to chips produced in Taiwan. Around a third of PC processors are produced in Taiwan. Most of the AI accelerators and data centers. Um, and then an array of other chips used in dishwashers and automobiles and cell phone towers. Uh, there would be just tremendous disruptions, not only in the tech sector, but across all manufacturing. And so I think the numbers that have been cited uh, in the reports that you mentioned, $2.5 trillion of cost in year one alone is a very plausible number. And that doesn't count the cost in year two and year three and year four. But the reality is it would take over half a decade to rebuild the lost capacity in Taiwan if that were knocked offline. And I think the best example of this is last year in, at the peak of the chip shortage, the companies that make chip manufacturing equipment were facing deficits of semiconductors that slowed down their production capabilities. So, so imagine that Imagine that dynamic if Taiwan were knocked offline. We'd wanna build new chip making facilities, but we couldn't get the machines we needed because they also rely on a supply of chips, uh, including from Taiwan. So the risk here is, is really enormous in dollar terms. Uh, it's so large that it's almost hard to get your head around. But I worry that it's it's so large that policymakers don't really take it seriously because it seems too large to think about. And that's the wrong way to approach issues that are this important. Great. Uh, Joris, Chris, thank you. Joris, those were great, uh, uh, great questions that you uh, posed there and a very helpful uh, transatlantic perspective and a perspective uh, from a country that probably that more than more than most is affected by Washington's decisions on uh, on export controls, and a country that has worked very closely with us uh, in the past. Uh, with that, we'll uh, we'll turn to some uh, questions from the audience here. We've got some very good questions here. Uh, I'm going to start off with uh, Mike Splitter, and uh, it's great to have you with us, Mike. Mike. Uh, is the former co-chair of the American Semiconductor Center. Uh, it's hard to imagine anything better than that, but he got a, uh, an even better offer. He is leading the uh, uh, industrial advisory group to the implementation of the CHIPS Act. Uh, 
uh, which is, is, is obviously critical. He brings to that tremendous uh, experience having been CEO of Applied Materials and with a very distinguished career in the audience. So I think we're all very lucky to have him in that position. His question is, uh, for the foreseeable future, will we be, uh, for, excuse me, for the foreseeable future, we'll be dependent on Taiwan and South Korea for the most advanced chips. What policies do you recommend to motivate and deter China from taking more aggressive action against Taiwan? Well, well thank you, Mike, for the question. I think this is partly a, a military challenge, but also partly a political challenge and a diplomatic challenge. Uh, on the military front, it's clear that there are lessons to be learned for Taiwan from the Russia-Ukraine war and applying them to Taiwan's defense and helping Taiwan acquire the systems that it needs to make uh, a Chinese attack or blockade much more costly uh, is really very crucial. Uh, and I do worry that when we hear Taiwanese government officials speak and, and look at U.S. defense planning timelines, the defense procurement process often stretches out over many years, if not decades. Uh, and, and I think there's plenty of work to be done to make sure that in a matter of a couple of years, Taiwan uh, gets meaningful new capabilities and that the U.S. defense industrial base has the capacity to ramp up uh, production uh, in a way that can, uh, can both rebuild our stockpiles that have been depleted by the Russia-Ukraine war and also provide new equipment to Taiwan. So I think there's a real aspect of military deterrence here, which we've got work to do on. Um, and I think no one should underestimate the extent to which the Russia-Ukraine war, uh, important though it has been for U.S. security interests in Europe, has actually created some new dilemmas for the U.S. in Asia by running down stockpiles of critical munitions. So that's, that's step one, is do better on the military deterrence front, uh, where we've been talking a lot over the past couple of years, but actual substance, I think, has lagged meaningfully behind um, uh, the, the, the conversation. I think the second front is to do everything we can to make sure that our political declarations and our political signaling on Taiwan don't get ahead of our actual deterrence capabilities. And here, I do worry that uh, in Washington, Taiwan has become a popular issue for politicians to talk about and a popular place for political leaders to visit. And I think some of that is, is to be encouraged. But there's a risk, I think, that rather than following Teddy Roosevelt's dictum of speaking softly and carrying a big stick on Taiwan policy, our political leaders have been speaking rather loudly uh, while not increasing the size of the stick that they're carrying. And so I, I do think there's a balance to be struck there uh, in terms of not being overly provocative against Beijing uh, in the period when we're trying to build up our defensive capabilities vis-a-vis uh, -vis China when it comes to uh, Taiwan. And striking a balance on that issue, I think, is, is, is absolutely critical um, going forward. Uh, thank you. Uh, a quick a quick thought here. Another impact, I think, out of Ukraine is uh, that leadership uh, in Washington and in the uh, and in the non-Chinese, non-Russian world has taken away the lesson that sometimes authoritarian leaders actually mean what they say uh, and actually do what it looks like they're uh, going to do or interested in doing uh, if it's something that's important enough to them and even if it entails uh, taking all kinds of risk of economic sanctions and, and other things. I think it kind of uh, 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 eliminates some of the sort of Norman uh, Angel uh, uh, illusions about what, uh, what countries will or will not do, even if there's a, a web of economic cooperation that would seem to argue against, uh, uh, against aggressive steps. Uh, let, let's move to a more technical question here from Mr. Uh, Mr. Fred Perkins. Um, question is, uh, chips merely enable software firmware logic. Can't software advancements such as parallel processing and communications with remote data sources neutralize advantages based on uh, chip performance? Um, and then in brackets, this neglects the remote possibility of quantum computing on a, on a chip. Um, Chris? Well, I would say setting aside the quantum question, which, which is important, but I think distinct from our conversation here, I, there's no doubt that all of, despite all the improvements in software, which are real, the fact that Moore's law has provided a doubling in computing power uh, for over 50 years straight 
uh, has made possible all of the software that we take for granted. The fact that, uh, that software designers get 50% more transistors on a uh, on an annual basis uh, is just an extraordinary gift that the semiconductor gives to the world. Um, and there's nothing you can do on the software side uh, to compensate if that, uh, if that free transistor budget that everyone gets every year uh, were to disappear. So software is important, obviously. Uh, there's been a, a big trend over the past several years in, in more specialized chip designs where chips are optimized for specific types of workloads, um, which makes them capable of uh, getting more performance uh, with the same uh, number of, of transistors, uh, to, to put it kind of roughly, but there's really no replacement for pure brute force computing power, uh, which Moore's law has delivered on an increasing basis uh, almost every single year for the past half century. And so we've got a very strong incentive to make sure uh, that that dynamic doesn't change or doesn't slow down. Thank you, Chris. Um, looking at the supply chain again, we we focused heavily on the middle uh, and we've also gone upstream to the raw materials uh, end, of, end of things. Uh, a question here from uh, uh, Mr. or Ms. YC Chua. Um, on the, uh, the, 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 the furthest downstream end, uh, which is the OSAT or offshore uh, assembly and testing, uh, which uh, kind of like it sounds like is where the uh, uh, finished chips from say Taiwan or Korea or wherever are actually put together uh, typically in, in Taiwan or in China or in Southeast Asia uh, and become uh, re ready to go into an actual, uh, into an actual piece of, uh, of, of equipment. The question is, uh, does the CHIPS Act support the OSAT ecosystem? Do you think that this ecosystem is something the U.S. should reshore uh, in order to complement the manufacturing ecosystem here? Uh, one, one thought that's sort of embedded that in that is uh, that even if we build chips here in the United States at the advanced cutting edge uh, uh, of technology, uh, we may then have to send them to uh, Malaysia uh, to be uh, uh, to be assembled and, and tested, and then they have to come back here. So, at, at a minimum, that would just create a bit of a, a bit of a kink in the chain. Um, anyway, Chris, well, it certainly is is an issue. I, I think onshoring most OSAT work is unlikely, given that uh, the the cost advantage of having low cost labor overseas is really meaningful in this particular part of the supply chain. Um, but I do think that there is widespread recognition that uh, the share of OSET work that happens in China uh, is a challenge and, and does certainly counteract uh, the general thrust of trying to reduce reliance uh, on China. There's discussions underway about different places uh, that OSAT facilities could be set up in the Western Hemisphere, um, other uh, facilities in Southeast Asia, uh, I think, that are outside of uh, China and Taiwan are under discussion. So this is an important part of the question. I think it certainly is a, a less technologically intensive uh, uh, part of the supply chain relative to fabrication or design or the tooling uh, involved. So there's less focus on it, um, but certainly it's something that, that can't be ignored. And it's it's the sphere of chip making where China's made the most uh, substantial advances uh, over the past decade in terms of market share for Chinese firms. Yeah, and, and I think, thank you, Chris, to, to go back to the question, the, the, the Chip Act, CHIPS Act does have provisions, I'm pretty sure, that do support uh, uh, a study and, and, and creating new options at the OSAT end of things. I'm sorry, I don't have it in, in, in front of me. Um, but I think Congress was very much aware of that part of the, uh, uh, of that part of the equation. Um, okay, we have a couple of, I'm going to, I'm going to um, I'm going to ask two questions together here, uh, which are somewhat uh, 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 complementary. Uh, they fit into some of the earlier discussion, but they had some additional elements. One is from uh, Alex uh, Villamins. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, it is, could the recent U.S. export controls that attempt to cut China off from certain advanced chip making technology backfire by giving Beijing more reason to invade Taiwan, i.e. to gain full control of TSMC's facilities? And from Mr. Thomas Higgins, uh, can you speak a bit uh, as to how the chip war between the U.S. and China is affected by tensions surrounding the sovereignty of Taiwan, uh, another global semiconductor chip hub, chip hub uh, and how these geopolitical tensions risk exacerbating this conflict? 
So that's a that's a big Taiwan question. Yeah, well, I, I think the scenario in which China attacks Taiwan and succeeds in um, taking the chip making facilities intact is so unlikely. I think it's it's close to a zero percent probability. And chip making facilities are full of the most precise machinery ever invented in human history, all sorts of explosive chemicals. So we had to think of manufacturing facilities least likely to survive a war. Chip fabs are it. And in addition to the facilities, you need the employees to, uh, you need most of them to stay and none of them to be sabotaging uh, the production capacity in, under a sort of hypothetical Chinese occupation regime. And then on top of that, you need the Taiwanese government to have not destroyed them and the US government not to have destroyed or sabotaged them in the process. And if all those conditions were met, the facilities would still need to import chemicals, materials, et cetera, from, uh, from Japan and the US and, and elsewhere. So it's just really unrealistic to think that China could invade uh, and grab the facilities intact. Now, do Chinese leaders realize that? Do they know enough about semiconductor production to know that fact? I'm not sure. Um, but I think we, sh we shouldn't worry um, that if China invades, it's going to get the facilities intact. There's a lot of other reasons to worry, but that's not uh, that's not one of them. What I think is 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 more worrisome, possibly more likely than a sort of D-Day style invasion from China, is a gray zone move, a sort of Crimea in 2014 style seizure of one of the offshore islands, for example, or a partial blockade imposed uh, at first without firing a shot. And the risk uh, from the U.S. perspective and from the Taiwanese perspective of uh, something that was below the threshold of what looked like a military conflict, even if it dramatically raised the stakes, is that the U.S. might struggle to respond effectively to a move in that direction. Consider, for example, if China were to occupy one of the um, small uh, islands in, in the Taiwan Straits that's currently controlled by Taiwan, which it's plausible it could do bloodlessly for some of the smallest of the islands, and then looked at the U.S. and said, your move, what would you do? The U.S. president would get a briefing. I would say, dear Mr. President, uh, you can either do nothing or you can respond in a way that would risk military escalation and be guaranteed to impose massive disruptions to the global economy. And I think there's a real risk in such a scenario that the US president would do nothing in response, uh, just like we did in Crimea, when we encouraged the Ukrainians not to defend their territory uh, from the Russian annexation. And I think such a move would be, or could be devastating for Taiwan's uh, ability and willingness to defend itself. And it would be devastating for US credibility in the region. So that's actually the scenario I worry more about. Uh, and in those, in that scenario, our confidence in our access to Taiwan semiconductor production facilities and our confidence that Taiwan will continue imposing U.S. export controls, I think would decline quite dramatically thereafter because our military position would be shown to be uh, much less convincing, much less credible than it was previously thought to be. So I don't think we spend enough time thinking about the gray zone or Crimea style scenarios in the Taiwan Straits uh, relative to uh, a scenario that starts with all out war. I think the phrase is a, a paper tiger, uh, which I think Mao accused us of, of being incorrectly clearly. Um, okay, I think this is going to be our last question. This is from Mary Lee Pollitt with the Aerospace Industries Association. Um, and it goes back, uh, takes us back to the U.S. end of things. Um, in the past, U.S. industry has converted and retooled domestic production capacity to manufacture necessary materials or goods to meet national security goals, such as in World War II. Uh, can that approach be taken for semiconductors, or do they uniquely require building production capacity from the ground up? Well, I think the, the complexity, the specialization, the sophistication of the tools you need for making advanced ships means that there's, there's no way to retool other facilities um, for the process. You need ultra precise machinery that's designed specifically for that purpose. And so if we needed to surge capacity in a crisis, we would need our existing tool makers to ramp up their production of tools. And I think that's something that we can't take for granted. The reality is that most of the tool makers have already booked out their capacity for uh, some months in advance. And in a crisis, could they double their capacity? I think that's a pretty heavy, um, a pretty heavy ask, given the precision, given the number of components involved. Let's give you one example. In, in just one of the key components of an EUV lithography machine, there are 457,000 component parts. And that's just the laser inside of an EUV lithography machine. So our ability to surge up production 
uh, these types of machine tools in a crisis, I think would be very, very difficult. And, and the, the production surge that we saw during World War II is probably, and unfortunately, not a model that we could very easily replicate. Thank you, um, uh, Chris. Okay, I do not see any more questions in the, uh, in the chat box or the Google box. So I think that brings us to the end of a very productive and I hope for everyone interesting uh, session. Uh, uh, Dr. Miller, Chris, thank you uh, so much. I know uh, you're a busy guy uh, talking about this book. You, your, your timing, as Robbie pointed out, has been, uh, has been terrific and we very much appreciate you joining us today. Uh, Joris, thank you, uh, thank you for joining us as well. Courtesy of the, uh, courtesy of the transatlantic cable, and uh, of course, everything we've done here today has been uh, completely enabled by uh, enabled by chips. And uh, thank you uh, to everyone in the audience for uh, for tuning in. So uh, I wish everyone a great day and uh, a great weekend. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris and Peter.